when we're depressed, we remember all the horrible things that happened to us. That those memories are contained within that state. We make the erroneous assumption that that past causes the current upset. No wonder I'm depressed. Look at all the terrible things I remember. What if, whenever I'm depressed, I have these horrible thoughts and these memories are contained within a particular state of mind? So that would be state-dependent memory. So we have state-dependent learning, state-dependent performance, state-dependent memory. The anticipated future is also state-dependent. If we're feeling anxious and fearful, it's hard to imagine a wonderful future. The worried, anxious, current state only foresees gloom and doom. If we can recognize that when the anticipated future is not the future, it's a mirror of the current state. And the memory is not a window into the past. It's a mirror of the state in which memory is occurring we can begin to recognize the power and potency of the prevailing current state. Instead of arguing that that's really how it is, and look at what I've been through, and no wonder I'm this way. You would be too, <laughs> if you had been through what I've been through. And of course, tomorrow has to be horrible because the past is horrible, the past has become the present, and the present becomes the future. So recognizing state-dependent phenomena, A, and that all perception is interpretation, B, and all interpretation is state-specific, body-mind state, and learning to regulate learning to regulate the state of mind and the state of body could be useful. Um, what we want to be able to do is to be able to recognize that a state of mind and a state of body is always operative. And that that condition affects content. And rather than trying you stay anxious and stop thinking that way. That you, instead of trying to change the content of thought, and, I, and, I, and I've certainly practiced cognitive behavioral <coughs> therapy, cognitive therapy, worked with a lot of different approaches, and sometimes people have difficulty changing the content of their mind from negative stinking thinking to positive wonderful thoughts. Sometimes it's hard. <laughs> and then sometimes when you do it, you don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that that other stuff is real and this is just a positive affirmation that isn't gonna work. <laughs> now if we can recognize that as content, <coughs> if that's content, that's occurring within a larger field. And that the condition of the field forms the content. That there's a, a vibrational field. And in that vibrational field, scary thoughts are occurring. But the whole vibrational field is, is anxious. <clears throat> You can't keep the same vibrational frequency of that field and change the content of the thought. I mean, maybe you can, but a lot of people can't. So instead of trying to 
change the content, you change the frequency of the field. And as you change the frequency of the field, you slow the frequency down. And you expand the field, and voila, different thoughts occur. Because the thoughts that arise, arise out of a vibrational frequency of the body-mind field. So as we change the context, we change the content. And, and because we tend to be so thing-oriented, our approaches have been to change the thing that appears in the field. And what I'm suggesting is we work with the field. <coughs> Tempo. Experience is tempo related. If you slow the tempo, <coughs> there's a different experience than if the tempo is key. Do we have any musicians here? Yeah, we know the importance of tempo. Tempo, frequency, all of those are relevant. And that phenomena exist <coughs> within a certain frequency of, of tempo. So in that way, as we work with time another way, as we begin to see time as tempo, or time as rhythm, or time as pacing, and instead of focusing so much on the content of the time, we regulate the flow of the experience of time. We affect and influence the content. You can do it with time, you can do it with pitch. <coughs> As you speak to your people, <laughs> in a slower, more calm, deeper way, they can tune into the station <laughs> and send their donation. <laughs> Tempo, timing, pitch, <clears throat> they're all influenced that is separate from, or in addition to, content. Well, encouraging is that we recognize a phenomenon or a current within a larger field of time, in a larger field of space. And if we can begin to appreciate the context of time and space in which content arises, and we begin to regulate those dimensions of time and space, we affect and influence the quality of the lived experience. Now, that's not usually how the self knows. The self knows things that are separate from itself. The self knows that it is separate from that, so there's a self and a that. And there isn't an appreciation, the self does not have an appreciation for the larger field of time and space, which is supported and is the context of experience. As we appreciate the field, we begin to access a knowing that is not the way the self has been taught. It's not the way the culture, the language, or the times, or the family of origin has taught us to think. But as we appreciate these larger dimensions, the dimensionality that's vibrantly alive and completely open, what if, what if space were alive? What if space were alive? And 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 and, and as we as we receive the breath. You receive the living presence. 
that infused and supported our being. That every breath would have an animated, enlivening quality. And we might feel fully alive. We might feel completely open. <coughs> we might enjoy a certain vibrancy of being. It would be another way of knowing. 